This is Educated Artistry. guys welcome back to a new episode of educated artistry today i'm super excited to be joined by cameron she started her pmu career in 2016 and since then has opened up two other locations and started training other women as well during covid like many of us she was forced to shut down and started to struggle with alcohol consumption and depression after numerous attempts of quitting In 2021, she quit drinking for good. This led her to creating Lucid Lush, which is a beverage company that specializes in making craft non-alcoholic cocktails. I was actually first introduced to Lucid Lush on TikTok, of course. I came across a video of somebody trying it, so I knew I had to order a mixed pack. And I shared my thoughts on an Instagram story, and then Cameron and I started talking in the DMs and I found out that she was also in the beauty industry and Lucid Lush was her new business that she started. So I'm super excited to have you on the podcast today, Cameron, and talk about your journey with your beauty business and starting your new baby business that you have going on with Lucid Lush. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Kayla. I'm really happy to be here and to share my story with you. Yeah. So where, I know you started, you've been in the beauty industry for about six years. So can you kind of tell me what got you started in the industry and into PMU? Yeah. So I've always been interested in beauty. You know, I was that girl plucking eyebrows on the desk in high school, but um, basically my mom had wanted to get her eyebrows done. And this was in 2016. So microblading and everything was somewhat newer. Um, I started researching places for her to go. And then that's when I kind of realized that it was something I would be interested in doing. So I found a class. It was like the first class that that place was offering. So it wasn't the best, but it kind of got my foot in the door. And from there, I kind of just, I started doing brows at home which I don't recommend, but that's what I had to work with. So I was just doing like family members. And then once I started getting some word of mouth going, I rented a room from another salon and built my clientele there. And two years into that, I opened my own place and I started um, another location on a different island, Kona, Well, the island is Big Island, but Kona is the town I was working in. So I would fly there once a month to service clients there as well. So yeah, that's how I got started. It happened at the perfect time because I was going through a divorce and he was the one who was, you know, making most of the money. I was staying at home with my son. So right as that was happening, I started permanent makeup and was able to support myself and my son. So it's perfect timing and it's been great. I mean, it's opened so many doors for me and allowed me to start Lucid Lush, you know, with the money that I've saved over the years from permanent makeup. Yeah. So that's really cool. So you are your, cause I know you have two locations, so they're on two different islands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm on Oahu. Oahu is the island with Waikiki. It's like the main touristy island, I guess. And then Big Island is the island with the volcano. So I fly, it's like a 30 minute flight. I just fly back and forth for clients. Yeah. That's kind of cool to be able to just like island hop over. And then did you decide to open a location in Kona just because of like there was more people there and like a higher demand for services? Or what was your reasoning with opening a location over there? There was a higher demand there. I had started doing it when I was still slow here just to kind of be busy. And then I got busy here and there. So I just had to manage both. I didn't want to leave the clients hanging in Kona and only focus here. So that's why I chose to keep both locations. Okay. Do you have employees or like booth renters at your locations? So I used to have employees before COVID. And then during, uh, you know, when they would let us do those little open up for a couple months and then shut back down. I had employees. Uh, It just 
kind of it wasn't working out for me. I prefer the booth renters. It's a little more, I feel like women in the permanent makeup industry are independent. So it's better if they're just renting the booth, in my opinion, because then they get to, you know, do their whole schedule and have their client relationships and it's less stress for me as well. Absolutely. I I have booth renters as well. And I've gone back and forth between like wanting to do employees or booth renters. And I'm like, I just kind of love that they just do their own thing. It helps, you know, you collect their rent every month. And then that's pretty much all you have to do. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) So where was your business at in 2020, like before all of the closures happened? Good. I mean, I had a steady brow clientele, you know, By then, it was year four for me, so I was getting my annual clients, my new clients, initial touch-ups. I had been training for two years at that point, so I was doing one-on-one and group trainings. It was a lot. There was a lot going on, and at that time, that's when I was, like, heaviest into my partying and happy hour. You know, it was, like, work party. That's all that mattered. It's clubbing on the weekends with other brow and lash girls. Like, it was fun, but... <laughs> I was saying before we started recording, I'm like, beauty business girls, like, know how to party. Like, they go all out. Like, conferences and stuff like that, I'm just like, people freaking go wild because I was in a very similar phase during that time as well. So when the shutdowns happened, how long did you guys have to stay closed for? So Hawaii had tiers, like tier one, two, and three. Permanent makeup was considered tier two. So I was shut down for like a total of six months out of 2020. They let us open and then we were open for like maybe two or three months and then they closed us again. It was tough. It was, I feel like it was even more tough the second time around because I had kind of got excited and was booking again and like, okay, things are going back to normal. And then without any notice, they were like, it was like a Thursday. They were like, we're shutting down again. So I was just like, oh, what am I going to do with myself? The work was, I feel like, keeping me sane. And when it was taken away, I just kind of crumbled. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel you. So did you feel like you were partying and stuff with you know, your friends before all the closures happened? Do you feel like you've kind of always struggled with alcohol consumption? Or do you think that you were kind of already struggling and then 2020 just kind of peaked it by having all the closures? What was your journey like with that? So in my opinion, me at the time, I didn't think I was struggling. I thought my partying was completely normal and everyone around me drank daily. So it didn't seem like I was doing anything wrong. I didn't see myself as suppressing any feelings or anything. Only now I can see that that's what I was doing. But it was very manageable before 2020. I was able to, you know, just drink at night or, you know, evening and stuff. And then there were times where I would go like a week or a couple days in between drinking and stuff like that. It wasn't really a problem. I experienced a a scam, I guess, a theft right before COVID. And it basically wiped out my bank account. So I feel like COVID happening and then that happening, that's what kind of sent me over the edge, like over, over the edge where I was just, you know, a mess. Being home during COVID and not really having anything to do, I started day drinking and it seems like that was like the tipping point for me to call myself an alcoholic. Then I was like, okay, like I feel like shit anytime I'm not drinking I just couldn't even sit with myself. So that's when it really started to be a problem for me and my family as well. They were like, where's Cameron? This is like, who is this person? Yeah, I think alcohol is such an interesting thing, like because it's so normalized of a substance that a lot of us abuse, right? Of drinking every day, getting happy hour. And this is something for me too, where I would say I was also before then like a very daily drinker, always having a glass of wine or three at night. Every weekend, it was like going out and having drinks or day drinking and stuff. And I I resonate with you with saying like, you know, that then when all the shutdowns happen, you're at home, you're kind of like, well, 
might as well drink. And that was kind of what everybody was doing too. And it was so normalized. So yeah, I think a lot of people actually resonate with that, with with really recognizing like, is this a problem? Like, because I was looking up and I can't remember now what the statistic was, but it was like considered for women being an over or drinking you know, a good amount. It was like eight drinks a week or maybe even less. And I was like, ooh, that can add up quick. And I was like, ooh, that's like, it could be a night, you know? And I was just like, oh, like that's over drinking. So um, no, that is, yeah, I just think that that's something that a lot of people have struggled with, but it's like not really normalized. And I don't know about you. Have you ever, now that you're, you know, sober, have you had where like you go out or even when you were starting your, your sober journey and you don't order a drink and people are like, why aren't you drinking? Yes, there has been. There was a little peer pressure from like my cousins and stuff in the beginning, but for the most part, people were really happy for me and supportive. There was just actually recently, like maybe a couple of weeks ago, I went out with some friends and they were like, okay, ladies, what are we drinking tonight? And I was, and I hadn't seen them for like, you know, since I got sober. So I was like, Ooh, I was like, I'm not drinking anymore. They were like, what? And they were like, shut up, you know? And so that was kind of like weird, but after that they were supportive. Nobody really pressured me into drinking or anything. Everybody's been really like, you know, respectful of it. For the most part, once I think they saw how serious I was about it, that's when I felt comfortable being around other people who were drinking without feeling pressured or left out. Right. Because it is such an interesting dynamic change when you go from being kind of like the party girl to, you know, being sober and hanging out with people that are also drinking and not having to be like, guys, I can I can still have fun and be sober. I think that's something that people always think too, like, oh, you're going to be lame tonight because you're not drinking with us. So that's great that you have really supportive people around you. So something that you had said when we were planning this episode that also really resonated with me was that you were living a double life as a professional by day and an alcoholic by night. So what did this look like for you? Like, you said you were able to manage it, but did you consider yourself an alcoholic, I guess, at that time? Or was it not until 2020 or when the closures happened? I, you know, I didn't really, I think had I known the definition of what an alcoholic really was, maybe I would have um, considered myself one, but I was just so uneducated about what alcoholism was that I just thought I was a party girl. And both my parents' parties, my sister part, you know, we all partied together. So I didn't consider myself an alcoholic, really. People told me I was, but I was like, no, I'm not. Like, I have this beautiful business and my son is taken care of. I have a house. I have a nice car. I was like, alcoholics are like on the streets or they have DUIs. They have, you know, they go to jail. You know, I just didn't. Yeah, I didn't consider myself one, but I definitely was one. <laughs> so what that looked like for me was, you know, waking up hungover was pretty much the normal. I kind of just learned to live with it. I was always like in a haze in the mornings, but I would get up early. I would take my son to school. I would get ready for work. I would go do my brow clients. And then after work, depending on what was going on, I would typically go to like Buffalo Wild Wings is right by my house. So I would go to Buffalo Wild Wings and just start taking Jameson shots or tequila shots with my best friend. And some nights I would be able to just do like a happy hour and go home. But most nights I would also get a bottle and go back home and drink that and then just repeat it throughout the week. And then Fridays, Saturdays were always club nights for me. And club nights would oftentimes need like a brunch the next morning where with mimosas and stuff. So that was like my weekends. But it was it was it was manageable at that time. There was like some nights where I would like black out and like fall or something, but that was like the worst that would happen before 2020. During 2020, I got in two car accidents and I was getting mean when I would drink. So, you know, or emotional, dramatic. I wasn't like abusive or anything, but, you know, just not myself. It was like I would get possessed by alcohol demon or something. 
which sucks because I grew up around my seeing my dad do that. So it was like what he would do, you know, and it, yeah, it's, it sucked once I finally was able to look at myself and I was like, ah, oh my God. Yeah. Do you feel like one of those like um, circumstance, was that like your breaking point? you know, like the car accidents or was there anything that just kind of, was there a breaking point for you? We're like, okay, I think I need to make a lifestyle change with alcohol. Yeah. So you would think that one of those car accidents were my breaking point, but it wasn't like, I just kept, I kept honestly, like when something bad would happen, I would drink more to not think about it. And that would cause something else bad to happen. But the breaking point was I actually had to, I went to the psych ward for evaluation because I was telling my dad that I was going to kill myself during one of my emotional um, drunken slurs, you know? So I went to the psych ward and I'm not crazy or anything. So it kind of let me sober up in there. And then somebody came in and was like, you know, I think you're an alcoholic. You should probably look into like a rehab or AA meetings and that's what I did because I couldn't believe that I was laying in the psych ward you know I was just like oh my god like this is this is out of hand it just that was the breaking point for me that's when I was like I I can't do this anymore did you go to any rehab or did you just start attending AA meetings what were your next steps I was determined to go to rehab when I got out. I was looking for rehabs. I had called some, but I jumped on a Zoom meeting for AA. And as soon as it was like a women's meeting. And as soon as I heard the women talking on there, I was like, this is me. Like they're all, it was a bunch of women basically saying my story, like exactly what I'm saying right now. And I just kept doing the meetings and I got a sponsor and um, I didn't feel the need to go to rehab. I did like, honestly, my cravings like didn't exist after that, which is crazy because, you know, there had been so many other times I had tried to stop and situations where I should have stopped. But for some reason, this one was the one to bring me to that moment of clarity where it's like, I don't want to have to depend on the alcohol anymore to make me happy when it's causing all these problems for me. Yeah. It's definitely like um, a big coping mechanism. I feel like that a lot of us use, you know, it's like have a bad day, turn to a drink, want to celebrate, turn to a drink, you know, something went wrong, turn to a drink. So how did you find the group? Yeah, there was a social worker who recommended to me when I was in the psych ward. She said, this is a place where uh, alcoholics come to heal and I was just like, okay, so I'll check it out. <laughs> and then, yeah, so I was like scared shitless to go to an in-person meeting. So I would go on to the Zoom meetings and I would keep my camera off and I would just listen. I wouldn't share. I wouldn't talk. I would just listen to the meetings. So I listened to them probably for like two weeks. And then I found a women's only group. And then I finally turned the camera on and I would talk to those women. They were on Zoom because of COVID. So once they were allowed to do in-person meetings, I started going to the in-person meetings with just that group. I don't really care for the meetings with men. And I don't know. I just really, I just really vibed with this group. They're all like, you know, there's a lot of younger girls in there too. So I've just been sticking with that. It's only once a week, so it's perfect. And then my sponsor is really awesome too. She's like an on-call therapist. Yeah. So did you find the sponsor through the group? Yeah. So I actually, I had a sponsor and then she like left the program because she felt like she was ready to like just drink socially and stuff. And that was after nine years of her being in the program. But um, that was like three months into my sobriety. And then I got a different sponsor who has like 18 years of sobriety. So I was like, oh, wow, like, let me see what this chick is doing to stay sober. That's amazing. You were able to find um, a group. And I think that's sometimes the hardest part is to find a group that you're one, you feel supported and that you feel comfortable sharing, because that's got to be sharing a lot of really vulnerable topics. I mean, even just now, like in our interview, like a lot of vulnerable topics have been brought up. So that's like huge to find a group and a community that you can feel comfortable with. 
What were some of your next steps after you started, you know, going to this group once a week, whether it was Zoom or in person? What were kind of some of your other steps that you did with cutting out alcohol? So the program has you do basically moral inventory of yourself and you get to write down like all of the resentments that you have towards people or places or things. And when you write those resentments, like you write why you're resentful at them and then your part in that situation. And then you go and make amends for your part in that situation. So I feel like doing that really freed me from a lot of the reasons I was drinking. I didn't realize how much like anger and resentment I had towards my parents. So when I made that amends with them, it just like, it lifted a weight off of me. And then there was a lot of other things. There was like some fallouts I had with some friends and my ex-husband. I didn't make an amends to him, but I did a inventory, which kind of just like put my feelings on paper. And I feel like that was honestly the most freeing thing that I was able to do. And then kind of just starting to pray and stuff to my higher power really helped me as well because I didn't have any sense of religion or anything before this like I did I was raised Christian but I didn't really believe it so just having I don't know the universe or whatever you want to call it just having that like relationship just I don't know it it helped I don't know it's like magic I guess no I mean that that's amazing. And I feel like that's so important to take like the inventory. I feel like so many things too, because it's all like triggers that cause us to go to these things as like our vice. It sounds kind of like shadow work to me. I don't know if you've ever like heard of that, but I do like a shadow work journal where it gets deep and it's really hard. Sometimes people glorify it. And I'm like, if you're actually doing it and even like taking inventory of these things and understanding your part in it, it's really hard, uncomfortable work to do. It definitely is. Anytime I would do inventory, I would feel kind of depressed for like a week after because I would just be like, wow, like I did that or like I was acting like that or, you know, you just feel bad about yourself. Like I felt worse all these months or years later after the situation than I did when the situation happened. Seeing it with a sober eyes, it just hit different. Oh, for sure. So when was the idea of Lucid Lush born? So that was born in 2022 when, so I got sober in 2021. And when I would go out, I was drinking like so many seltzers, like every single seltzer you could think of, like bubbly, ahas. I was just like the seltzer queen. And they always just kind of tasted a little like odd or flat. I don't know. It's not but, as fun. It's like, you're like, yeah. I want a cute drink that looks fancy and nice. Yeah. And then when I would go to restaurants, the mocktail options are like so sugary or they just have soda water and lime, which is like, okay. But yeah, I was just like, thinking one day I was like what if I made like a drink that tasted like a cocktail but didn't have any alcohol in it and so everybody was like oh yeah that would would be kind of cool so then I started looking online and then I stumbled upon the whole non-alcoholic mocktail movement that has kind of started popping up everywhere it's still newer but I mean it's growing like at a rapid rate and once I saw that I saw the predictions on the market I was like oh like if I'm gonna do this I need to do it now so I blindly went into it I have no background in the beverage industry I just literally started googling like how do I make a drink so I found a flavor formulator they helped me turn my ideas into actual drinks And they kind of just like pointed me in the right direction. They were like, oh, you need to get a co-packer. So I went and found a co-packer. That's the one who actually cans the drinks. And yeah, I just kind of been taking step after step. Do you mind if I ask what was like the upfront investment of creating a beverage? Because I feel like that's a lot of little, you know, to do the flavor and the packaging. And that seems just like a lot of little pieces. So I did it the budget friendly way, like I'm not a millionaire or anything. If I was, I would have did like, you know, full glam boxes and everything. But for the flavor formulation, 
that was the cheapest part. It was about $5,000. And then the actual canning was the most expensive because they have like minimum order quantities. So I had to make 20,000 of each flavor. So that part was the most expensive. That was about 30,000. So just for the drinks alone, about $40,000. And then that's not including like marketing or advertisement materials and, you know, all the little things, insurance that come with that. So it definitely went over budget, but I believe in it. I feel like it's worth it. Yeah, no, and I've tried it. There was just a TikTok video that came up of a girl I follow, and she was trying it. She's like, this is what I'm going to be drinking this summer. It was the strawberry margarita one, and I was like, wait a minute. I need those because it is like – it's really hard going out and wanting to have a mocktail, and I'm the same where I'm like, I don't really like sugary drinks anyway, but it's like you want something that just feels like you're having a drink that's not just a soda water or a seltzer, and even grabbing things if it's like a pool day or you're going to the lake with your friends or doing things, it's like you want to have like that but not – just have a water. So I was really excited. I was like, oh, I got to try these because I'm going to have these at the pool all summer long. And they were super, super good. And I like that they're like pretty low in sugar and the calories are low, which is really nice. And then remind me your other flavor. So we have a strawberry margarita and cucumber melon mojito. So I formulated four flavors when I first got started, but I could only afford to do the two flavors. Yeah. So I have two more flavors. Once I sell through this batch that I'll bring on. They're more like tropical, summery flavors. Okay, cool. So what has been your process with building your like brand and your marketing with Lucid Lush? I see that you do some little pop-up stores, it looks like. Yeah, so we do like some pop-up bars, actually. So the places that we have gotten the drinks into, like there's this one coffee bar that we've been working with a lot and it's a BYOB so people can bring their own alcohol if they want but the mocktails are what's sold there so with our drinks there's several different recipes that you can make with them for example like we have a coconut mojito with the cucumber melon mojito or you can also make like a Moscow mule with the mojito uh, if you just mix it with ginger beer. So that's what we serve at those events. Those are great. Just, you know, getting people familiar with the name. What I think has been really helpful is like the foodie fest and like farmer's market type things because we give out samples there and then people can buy them in person and meet us and ask us any questions. I have been trying to build the brand with influencers but they're that's kind of pricey like (laughs) it's pretty pricey and I've already gotten burned by one of them I sent her the drinks and she never posted so that's kind of where we're at now just building the brand to be recognized so that once we do get into actual like grocery stores people are buying them off the shelf and know what they are because with the grocery stores if they're not selling, they just will drop you and not take you back. So you have to be like ready for that industry if you want to take it there. Yeah. Have you started that process of taking it into grocery stores? No, there's one local market that we're in and they have four locations. And then the rest of the places that we're in are like little bottle shops or locally owned restaurants. And we just are negotiating a deal with the Ritz Carlton here to have the drinks as an amenity but it's not finalized yet so that's where we're at right now with it hopefully I could keep doing the markets and stuff and then maybe look at getting like all four flavors into stores next year or something yeah that is really exciting though that's super cool and I do think that you're smart for jumping on it you know early because I do think it's going to be such a big thing. Personally, I know a lot of people, let's just say even in the beauty industry and in my own social circle that have really been on this same kind of just a sober journey where maybe they're not a hundred percent sober, but they've really been evaluating their alcohol consumption and diving a little bit deeper on why they're drinking and kind of pulling back from that and doing more mocktails 
or limiting going out and stuff like that. So I definitely think there's like a high demand because there's only a few restaurants here in my area that even have like a mocktail menu. And every time I see it, I'm so excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can get a mocktail. Um, No, so that is super cool. And I'm excited for the new flavors to come out as well. Um, I do know that I want to make sure that people know that you did give a discount code to if they want to try this or it's a free shipping code, right? Yes. So actually, whatever is uh, whatever gives them more of a discount off. So the free shipping code I gave you and then I'll also give you this code here. EAP20. So for Educated Artistry Podcasts. 20. Yeah. So that will give them 20% off. You can't use them together. So whatever makes it, whatever works for them better, whether it's the free shipping or the discount. Okay. And I will put that into the show notes too, but I wanted to make sure we'll mention it again at the end of the episode, but I wanted to make sure that was in there because I'm sure that people are thinking like, I want to try these out. So I definitely want you guys to go get some and try it. I did the variety pack, which was the two flavors. And I think like four come in a variety pack, right? Yeah. And that was perfect. I actually think I ordered two variety packs because I wanted my sister and one of my friends to try them too. So that was my favorite. So that way I could try both of them. But what was the meaning behind the name Lucid Lush? I meant to ask you this earlier. So Lucid is luminous, aware, bright. Lush is a double entendre, basically. So flourishing is one definition, thriving. The other definition of Lush is a heavy or habitual drinker, which I didn't know. I had kind of, I liked Lucid Lush. And then when I was looking up the actual definition of Lush, I was like, no way. It's a drinker too. (laughs) So like, so you can call someone like, yeah, so you could be like, oh, you're such a lush. And that means like, you know, you're a heavy drinker. So that's kind of lucid lush is kind of the embodiment of what sobriety has been for me this whole time. I feel lucid and I feel luscious. Yes. <laughs> I love it. That's really funny though, that it, you're like, oh wait, that's what lush also means. And it had to do with drinking. Oh my goodness. So how has it been now that you, you know, have your PMU business and now you have this new business? How has it been kind of balancing or have you, are you still like having the same workload with your beauty business and adding this on or have you had to cut back? Like, what does it look like? I have decreased my beauty business by not marketing as much. I just kind of only taking the word of mouth or, you know, people who follow me on Instagram or book with on my online booking. So that's where I've kind of cut back. And I used to not really block myself days off, but I do now block myself at least two. I try to do three days off from brows. That way I could focus on drink work and, you know, go pitch the drinks to places and stuff like that. But it's definitely been a struggle trying to balance things. I am also a workaholic, so I can easily overload myself with work and neglect my, not neglect my family, but just not pay as much attention to them. So I definitely have to like, you know, hold myself accountable. Like, okay, like you've been working for eight days straight. It's time to take four days off next week and make sure at least two of those days you're doing something with your family or, you know, self-care is one of the areas I feel like I have neglected the most, my facials and no nails. Like, so (laughs) I've definitely cut back on the self-care too, but I guess that's not necessarily a bad thing because I was kind of doing a lot for myself before. So I figure, you know, these sacrifices will be worth it. You know, sacrifices that I'm making, that I'm cutting back and will be worth it when the drinks do start selling in grocery stores and all of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I think self-care is definitely so important, but I also think that sometimes it, to me, it sounds like a lot of what you're doing with like diving, you know, with your sobriety and diving into yourself and working through those hard things like that is self-care too at the end of the day. And I think that's true self-care, right? We sometimes be like, oh, a bubble bath and a face mask and like maybe a glass of wine, like whatever is self-care. And that's something that I'm guilty of like hyping and being like, oh yeah, self-care. But then I'm like, later on, I'm just like, you know, self-care is actually really hard work. 
because it, it's the deeper things. So I do think you are giving yourself self-care, you know, but getting your nails done and stuff is fun too. But I think you are, you're giving yourself that self-care. Yeah, you're, you're right, actually, because <laughs> I was thinking of the self-care, like, you know, facials and stuff. But in that sense, yeah, I am caring for myself a lot more than I used to. I don't think I really cared about before <laughs> and just like going you know being sober and so how long has it been now officially for you almost two years so yeah it'll be two years on July 13th okay you had mentioned about your other sponsor had you know decided to transition and drinking socially do you feel like that's something in the future that you would want to do or do you feel like you're pretty good with just sticking with the sober I don't think so I don't think I will I don't need it and I am a little afraid to feel like I need it again, feel like I need it to have fun and stuff like that. So at this point, I don't see myself doing that, but who knows? You know, I am literally only one drink away from relapsing. So, you know, it's, yeah, I, I don't think I would like to say no, but, you know, I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, I feel like it's still early. It's always just interesting because I feel like, I'm somebody too who it's hard for me to go out and have like two drinks. How people be like, oh, I just just have two drinks and be done and you're fine. And like for me, like once I start, I'm like, let's go. You know, it's like a party and it's hard to stop and limit it. So I wish I could be a social, more of a social drinker where that's all it was. But yeah, I just, it's not, I don't think it's for everybody. That's for sure. One of the thoughts I had the other day, I had asked myself this the other day, like I've done all of this healing and self work and stuff and I wouldn't be drinking over those same things that I was drinking over before but then as I was thinking that I was kind of like yes that may be true but I still get a certain way when I do drink and I don't think that is ever gonna go away like I get hype and I'm like you know anything can happen like someone else takes control of me (laughs) It's like, I don't know if I want to let her out again. Right. It's like what, like your alter ego or something where you have like a name for your drunk self. Where you're like, that was Sarah. Like, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, that was her. That was not me. So what would you like, what advice would you give somebody who is maybe listening and they feel maybe even that they're not an alcoholic or maybe they do feel like they are and they want to start tr- like being sober or you know, just bettering their relationship with alcohol, what advice would you give them? So if somebody thinks that they're an alcoholic, that is that takes a lot of courage to admit to yourself. And if they're able to admit that to themselves, I would just suggest going to meetings, finding a meeting that they really like. If they are nervous or they want to test the waters first, every single state in America, and I I'm pretty sure even other countries has Zoom meetings that you can go on and they don't require you to talk or put your camera on or anything. There's a chat box. You could say, I'm just here. I'm a newcomer. I'm just here to listen. And so you could test it out that way and see if you like what other people are sharing. If you do, then get a sponsor that can help you hold yourself accountable for all of that, like moral inventory, because You can try to do it yourself, but if you lie to yourself, then the moral inventory won't work because you won't, you know, be a hundred percent like, oh, this was my part. Or sometimes you need another person there who isn't involved in the situation to put their input. A therapist could also do that as well. So if somebody is just struggling and they feel like they're using it for emotional reasons, then go to therapy, you know, go to therapy and heal those parts of you that, you know, you feel like you're kind of running from or suppressing, see if that helps. Or they could try drinking mocktails and <laughs> try that mocktails. as a good replacement. Yeah. yeah, no, for sure. Did you have to drastically like change your social circle? You know, I hang out with the same people, just not as often. Yeah, I'm a lot more involved with my family. And my business. So that's kind of like my weekday focuses. And then um, on the weekends, like sometimes I'll go to the beach or like, you know, do a barbecue at my parents' house. But 
I feel like I have a, a healthier relationship with my friends as well, too. It was like where before like saw each other too much and there was drama or whatever. But I've met a lot of new friends, new sober friends as well. So that's been a blessing because, you know, they're just really good people who understand me and I they like the same things as me. And yeah, it's been it's been great. It's yeah, I can't complain. No, I think definitely finding people that are on the same journey as you is has got to be a huge help and really important for part of your process too. One of my last questions is I wanted to ask you, what would you tell 2020 Cameron today now that you've given up alcohol? I would tell her to go get help, but I honestly don't think she would have listened. So I don't know if there is anything that I could have been told because I was told, you know, I was told and it just whoop, went in one ear and out the other. So that's what I would have said to actually go get help. But I wouldn't I wouldn't change how anything happened because it led me here. Had it not happened the way it did, I wouldn't have made Lucid Lush. I wouldn't have met all these people. I wouldn't have healed those relationships with my family. I wouldn't have known how to heal the relationship with my family. So yeah, I don't, I wouldn't, that's what I would tell her, but I don't know if she would listen. Right. You're like, I'll tell her, but she's not listening. (laughs) Well, this has been amazing. And I just thank you for sharing your story and being so open and vulnerable about it too. I definitely think there's going to be a lot of people listening that are going to resonate with it. And even if they don't feel like they're in the alcoholic area that they, you know, may have just struggling a relationship with alcohol too. And I just appreciate you being so open about it because I think it is something important to talk about. And especially, I just love that it's also like wrapping in with women-owned business and then like balancing everything and that you're a mom. And it's just, you know, I really appreciate you taking your time and sharing your story. And I'm excited to see how everything grows with Lucid Lush. And um, why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Because I know you've got all of the socials and everything. So that way they can give you a follow. And then if they want to order too. Yeah. So if you want to follow us, the Lucid Lush page on TikTok and Instagram is at Drink Lucid Lush. And then if you want to purchase Lucid Lush and you're in the mainland, you can buy it on lucidlush.shop. And that link will be in our bio on social media. If you're in Hawaii, you can get them at all of the Kalapawai markets. And then restaurant-wise, you can get them at Dixie Grill, Posh Caribbean Grill, El Ranchero, Rise and Grind Coffee Bar, and there's more. Just follow us. I have a retailer's list posted (laughs) on social media. Oh, and then my brow page is Hawaii Brow Studio, if they want to follow that page. Perfect. And then you ship to all 50 states, right? Yes, we ship to all 50 seats. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, I'm so excited. And I will have the discount codes in the show notes for anybody so that way you can grab that 20% off. And um, definitely go give Cameron at Lucid Lush a follow so that way you guys can connect further and uh, let her know how you like the mocktail. Uh, I was also going to ask you too, because you said that you guys have some recipes that you like make with the mocktails, maybe we can like add one of those. Do you have links to any of those that we can add that people could try like to make them or? Um, I don't have a link. I can make a post about it though, if that helps. If you want to know some recipes, follow me. And I have some posted uh, like mocktail videos, but I can, I've been meaning to post more anyways. Yeah. I think that'd be cool to see people like make little recipes with it too. But Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Cameron. Thank you so much for having me, Kayla.